Um, good evening or greetings, everyone, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I'm very happy to say that we are, this is the inaugural um, lecture of the Athens PIL discussion group, which we started last year and which had a great success. So we are continuing uh, this year. And our first speaker is a very distinguished scholar who many of you know, uh, who's joining us for uh, this first discussion. Professor Martin Scheinen is a British, British Academy Global Professor at the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at the University of Oxford. He's a part-time professor at the European University Institute, where he previously served a full time as well. He has served as member of the UN Human Rights Committee and as special rapporteur on human rights and counterterrorism. He currently is a member of the Scientific Committee of the EU Fundamental Rights Agency. Uh, the Athens Public International Law Center, all our students and all our followers are very happy uh, to have Professor Martin shine in with us this afternoon. He will be speaking um, on an issue on call, uh, his the title of his, his presentation is Between Facts and Norms, Five Reflections on Theory, Methodology, and Practice of International Human Rights Law. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Maria Gavunelli, who you see also with us, will be uh, the discussant. And uh, I'm sure many of you might have questions or remarks. Please feel free, those of you who are following here, to put your remarks in on the, um, on the use the chat function. And then for the rest of you, you know how to get in contact with my colleagues, um, both Martina Papadaki and Dimitri Panusos. So Martin, welcome. It's very good to see you. Uh, this. This format allows, you know, um, Florence, uh, New York, uh, Geneva, um, Brazil, I don't know who else, China, to be together. So um, a very hearty welcome to you. It's good to see you. I'll give you the floor, I guess, about for about half an hour. It's up to you um, to give us your presentation, and then we'll, we'll start. We'll open a discussion uh, through Maria. So welcome, welcome, very good to see you. Thank you very much, Professor Patharsis. I was told 20 minutes. I have a lot to say because I'm going to offer five reflections of the general theme between facts and norms. I chose this approach because it's something which is bothering me and something which I plan to work on uh in, in the future and partly it reflects on things i have been doing over a very very long time i'm doing many things at at the moment uh, there would have been some substantive themes but i felt that it's 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 nicer to reflect with you uh a much broader framework i'll uh, give two warnings now my home internet is a little bit unstable so i may disappear for 30 seconds but don't worry i'll be coming back if i disappear <laughs> it has happened before and the second one is that uh, in 45 minutes i will be with my daughter so if you uh, if, if i need to get up and uh, put her back to watch her videos. <laughs> Please apologize me for not only 30 seconds, but a full minute. I'll move on. So I promised five reflections and I will start with a philosophical one. And that is about the distinction between uh, norms and sources of law in international law. And I'm always troubled how much confusion there seems to be. And the confusion is that people, including distinguished scholars and courts, seem to be mixing between norms and sources of law. And I would insist on the, on the application of Hume's guillotine, the separation between is and ought, or as Immanuel Kant put it, sein and sollen in German. They are two different worlds, and sources belong to the world of existence. Sources exist. There are treaties. There are customs. And 
there are national legal systems. Th those are the sources of law. But legal norms, they belong to the realm of ought, solemn, normativity, which actually is in the minds of human beings. Legal norms are simply um, relations between individuals or artifacts created by humans, such as the state. So one, one, one could use an analogy and say, it's like, it's, it's like colors. Colors don't really exist. <laughs> what exists has color. Similarly, what exists can be, uh, can be qualified as permitted or prohibited or obliged through the normative colors. But as such, obligation or permission doesn't exist at, as, as facts. So this is, this is my concern, and, and I think it would help uh, legal theory and legal analysis if we were more careful in separating between facts and norms and to speak about sources as what they are. They give rise to legal norms, to normativity, legal obligations, but as such they are not to be equated with the norms. And the tricky question of course is, is treaties because it's so common for lawyers simply to equate text of a treaty with legal norms but ultimately they are only efforts to capture through consensus by between states a binding legal norm which is then positivized but there's always room for interpretation the text needs to be interpreted when it's applied to practice and there's a scope of application and it has to be applied in a context which will determine whether it's applicable at all. So the valid legal norm is something different than we see immediately as a text of the treaty. And for uh, customary norms of international law, the situation becomes a bit more complicated even because here uh, actually the source is in the practice, in the empirical practice of states. And we are observing uh, whether that practice is habitual so that it becomes a custom and whether there's an opinion juris governing that habit, whether the states are doing this because they sense of being under a legal obligation. Only then we can say that the practice we are observing reflects the existence of a customary norm of international law. So the normativity comes from an assessment of that empirical practice. And finally, uh, principles of law recognized by nations requires an investigation into what are the legal uh, systems of several countries, uh, including not only text but law in practice what is the law as observed and from that uh, fairly general practice we then infer that there is a general principles that can be derived from uh, national legal systems which then becomes a source for international law obligations um, why i think this is important for human rights law is that it liberates the uh, process of applying and interpreting law from a stagnated approach to sources as being equated with the norms themselves. It allows for creativity in the application of the law. Uh, the, the, the process uh, of identifying sources of law and deriving the legal norms from the sources is a coherence building mechanism that allows for reconciliation between a multitude of sources that at first sight might apply to uh, might appear to collide and in this uh, scenario human rights law forms then an immanent critique immanent internal yardstick for other legal norms it is composed of legal norms with its own sources but it also allows us to um, have a critical assessment as to the relevance of other sources of law so that human rights law norms can govern, for instance, the determination of a case uh, 
uh, as, an, as a critical yardstick to the application of other sources of law. That was the first uh, observation, reflection. Now, the second one is about interpretation, where, again, I'm uh, rejecting something which is quite common among international lawyers. It's the perception that interpretation and application of a legal norm are two different steps. That we, we could first interpret in abstracto, in a vacuum, for instance, a treaty text. And then the, it would be a different matter whether it is going to be applied or not. I'm more in favor of a hermeneutic circle where we move constantly between application and interpretation. And actually, the scope of application is one of the major issues to be interpreted. If we want to make a distinction, we will first apply, interpret the source. We interpret, for instance, the text of a treaty as it is printed on, the, on paper, or we have, and interpret the practice of states, whether it is a custom that reflects opinion juris. That would be the first step. And the next step includes also interpretation. It includes interpretation of the norm that we have derived, including for its scope of application, for its coherence with other applicable norms, and uh, um, for the, for the uh, elimination of possible conflicts with other norms. So again, my conclusion is the same as under the first reflection. Uh, we have considerable flexibility for a contextual approach and uh, interpretation further liberates us from, from a, one could say, strictly textual positivistic approach to international law. I am a positivist myself, but I, I, I distinguish between the sources and the positive norms. And in, in my assessment, a lot of work and coherence building is needed already in inferring the norm from the sources. And then further in what is usually seen as the application phase, a second step of interpretation, which is interpreting the hence derived norm in its context, which is formed by the legal order as a whole. Third observation, third reflection uh, goes back to the years 2006, 2012, when I was uh, chairing a process with the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights on Human Rights Indicators. It started from uh, better use of statistics. Somebody in the office had in, invented that the work of the treaty bodies could be made easier if there were, were standardized categories of statistics which would allow determination whether they were countries were in compliance or not. Uh, one could say that the expert consultation process where I was involved and many other treaty body members and former members also were involved was kind of a uh, damage control process where we experts of human rights treaty interpretation sought to say it's not that simple that statistics give, could give us an answer whether human rights are respected or not. It's always contextual. But it grew to something bigger. It grew to a, a, a development of a multidisciplinary methodology in human rights assessment where empirical sciences and statistics do have a big role. But we went through the process of developing a methodology of structural process and outcome indicators, which would use indicator charts developed separately for each right. So we would look into the general comments of the treaty bodies, primarily the two covenant bodies, in order to identify attributes, substantive components under each of the human rights. And then we would look for structural process and outcome indicators for each of those. It became complex, one could say hopelessly complex, but at least we were able to st stay the uh, show to the initiators that it's not a question of simple application of statistics. You can use indicators, but the outcome will be a complex set of presumptions of, or pointers or rules of thumb. Uh, 
that these are the problematic areas, these are the solid areas for the country concerned, but there's always room for contextual assessment. At that stage, and this troubles me today, uh, we thought that ultimately it will be the treaty body members who through what could be called intuition or looks like intuition, take the results of the indicator charts and say, is this a human rights violation or not? So it was a multidisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary approach that we use social sciences for, for processing of the empirical data to give us pointers, but then it's for lawyers or functional lawyers, members of the treaty bodies, to make the actual, actual legal determination through treaty interpretation. I think it was an important step, uh, but an imp imperfect one, uh, b because what troubles me today is the idea that the applying lawyer, the judge, the treaty body member, could acceptably be some kind of a black box, that we just need to trust his or her expertise in a process which, which looks like intuition. I move to the fourth observation, which is uh, the next step in my career, uh, when I was running an EU-funded project called Surveil, Surveillance Ethical Issues, Legal Limitations and Efficiency. We moved more towards an interdisciplinary approach, where disciplines work together for a common assessment, instead of simply empirical sciences looking at the facts and we lawyers looking at the norms. So we uh, looked at surveillance technologies used in different situations and we, we used the empirical scientists, primarily technologists, also sociologists uh, and uh, economists to assess the benefits of surveillance. So they were giving scores through a panel which was multidisciplinary in itself. How good does this surveillance method work in protecting public order or promoting national security? There was a scoring system with the 10 different elements and uh, it was always context-based in the sense that we, we work with a scenario. The police is using this method of surveillance in this situation. How many points will you give? For the, for the outcome. And then we had a lawyer's team. We lawyers, we looked at the human rights intrusion, also giving scores. What attribute is affected? This is inherited from the indicators project. And what's the depth of intrusion? In a way, this builds upon Robert Alexis' model, the weight formula, which is based on the idea of comparing the benefit to words a collective goal against the human rights intrusion. But Alex's two problems, in my view, is that for him, everything is a matter of proportionality. There are no hard rules derived from human rights. And secondly, for Alex, uh, still there's the judge who uses intuition by assigning numbers from the triadic scale, one, two, or four. Whereas we tried to make the information more granular by, by having 10 different factors for the, for the uh, benefits of surveillance and actually 16 point scale for the human rights intrusion. I, I won't go into the details. To have a more structured approach, more granular information where empirical facts could be better used in legal uh, assessment of of the application of human rights norms. And uh, much of this ultimately boils, boils down to the well-known tests of necessity and proportionality. Necessity requires that the claimed benefit of a human rights interfering measure must be proven. There must be empirical proof that, for instance, surveillance de delivers better security. Only if there is proven benefit, it can be said that this method is necessary and that benefit must be 
so big that it cannot be achieved through a less human rights intrusive method. This is the necessity requirement. And the proportionality is then the comparison between the measured benefits toward the legitimate, legitimate aim, say national security, and the harm, the human rights harm, which is also quantified. So there's empirics on both sides of the equation and the normativity then comes from checking that there's legal basis, tick, that there's the legitimate aim, tick, that you don't violate the essence of the right. Here is the red line, which Alexei doesn't see, uh, that the necessity test is met and the proportionality ultimately is best. This, this is the legal part, but the empirics and the uh, lawyer says it, but the normative assessment are much closer to each other. And if there is a hermeneutic loop, it's an interdisciplinary one. We move from multidisciplinarity to interdisciplinarity so that the whole process will be transparent. And also the non-lawyers, the empirical sciences involved in the process can see in a, in a, in a different way than the black box of the judge why the outcome is this is a human rights violation or this is not because we have the quantified or quantifiable or at least semi-quantifiable evidence presented i'm very happy uh, that the human rights committee in its general comment number 37 on freedom of assembly uh, adopted a model which corresponds to what I have been describing as developed in the survival pro surveil project, which really uh, articulates the protection of the essential core of a human right, the necessity requirement and the proportionality requirement in a manner that requires the comparison between the proven benefit obtained through the intrusion in the service of the legitimate aim and its comparison against the measured human rights harm. So both sides of the equation are quantified and measured also under general comment 37, uh, C paragraphs 36 and 40. 36 about the inviolability of the essence and 40 for the, for the requirement of measuring both the uh, benefits and the human rights harm. That was the fourth uh, observation. The rigorous proportionality test where both sides of the equation are measured, quantified or semi-quantified is a way to marry facts and norms. The philosophical distinction between facts and norms remains but we can in a functional manner create a multidisciplinary model for uh, conducting human rights assessment that then allow for the application of the norm in a manner which is transparent also in relation to non-lawyers fifth and final uh, reflection is uh, that i propose that this approach should can and must be applied also in respect of collisions between human rights and here uh, i would counter the widely held perception that during times of crisis human rights fade away i think it is the opposite crisis situations including covid 19 has shown us that in these situations human rights increasingly are on both sides of the equation. We have different categories of people who are differently affected and who invoke different sets of human rights. Some invoke their right to health, some invoke their freedom of movement, and there's a collision. And the approach of measuring both sides, putting into the equation two colliding or competing human rights, will show us that the uh, facts and norms can be married also in the question of collisions between human rights. And I think this is my most important conclusion in respect of the, one, one would say, uh, skepticism, nihilism or doubts 
concerning the capability of human rights law in today's world. There is a lot of criticism that is based on the idea that there are too many human rights and too many rights of too many people, which cannot be complied with at the same time. And therefore, human rights law is indeterminate. I say the opposite. The more challenging the situation, the more needed is a rigorous approach to human rights and its methodologies, so that we would move to uh, assessing human rights on both sides of the equation. And ultimately, it will be the protection of the essence of every human right and the rest uh, determined through the proportionality assessment between the two competing rights, which will govern the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, all your five remarks are quite stimulating. Um, I would still, well, I'll let Maria, I have some comments, but um, Maria, go ahead. Well, <laughs> Especially uh, for the last point, but Maria, go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Martin. And um, I must say that um, I'm very, very pleased to uh, hear your, your five points, pretty much because they, they come into a discussion that we have just started uh, in my LLM class uh, on human rights just this past week. So really, as if we had uh, organized our, ourselves in, uh, in tandem in this particular respect. And that's perhaps my cue to uh, say a word about our LLM course uh, taught in English. And uh, all of you are very welcome to join us in this and further and future years. So um, I would have two major uh, points to make. But these uh, two points really break down in a number of other uh, comments, and I would uh, invite you to react to that. First comment, it has to do with your uh, distinction between the factual sources, so to speak, and the normative content. Uh, to my mind, this is very much a question of former content, isn't it? Uh, so, irrespective of the form, uh, the content could be normative, irrespective of um, uh, the uh, and you can find a norm in in pretty much whatever uh, package you may wish to find it and that is especially true in in uh, latter years when uh, we have uh, this idea of um, charters pacts pact on migration for instance or things like that that sort of bring together uh, into a form that is not necessarily uh, binding by definition, or at least in the traditional sense of the word, uh, norms that are most certainly binding. And therefore, you would have this relative um, normativity, if you like, but that, that's an interplay between uh, form and content. And we need to be aware of that duality in approach, if you like, uh, so as to be able to identify at all times uh, the correct form, whether actually what is the normative content in each particular situation. And that, of course, has to be related uh, with the question of interpretation and application. I quite agree with your normative uh, hermeneutic loop. Uh, I, I see no other way around it. Um, there is, this is a process. Uh, this is something that needs to be taken step by step. There is no, to my mind, that is perfectly clear. And perhaps that moves on a step further. Uh, you alluded to that, but perhaps you might wish to uh, elaborate a bit on, on that. What happens when uh, this uh, dynamic interpretation becomes, at the end of the day, evolutive interpretation, and, uh, and it, it moves over the board uh, to progressive development? And where exactly is the line between evolutive interpretation and progressive development? That's particularly crucial, I think, in uh, human rights law, uh, where we do have a number of new rights evolving or developing from existing rights, from contractual rights. And, and therefore, we need to be extra careful uh, or extra aware, if you like, of the development process so that we can actually identify such rights if they do exist. Uh, 
or um, influence their uh, eventual uh, creation, uh, their, their, their development through the process. That is perhaps my first uh, comment, and I don't know whether you would like to react to that now before I move on to the second, or whether you would like to take them together. Please go ahead, I'll take them together. Okay. The second point has to do with um, the idea of uh, human rights impact assessment, which is a, another one that is very close to my heart. We work on that in the Greek uh, National Commission on, on Human Rights, and we struggle with the practical applications uh, of, of the idea. Um, I, again, uh, I make a number of assumptions, which I think reflect uh, your thinking as well. Um, my first assumption is that we're talking, in essence, about the quantification of the normative content. Uh, so that quantification has to uh, be understood in, in a vertical term, in sort of concentric circles, if you like, where the stronger, the, the, the nucleus of, of, of the norm uh, uh, corresponds to necessity, and then you have other things in 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 a, in in a second circle, if you like, that could be determined by proportionality. Um, I'm not so sure whether it, this kind of concept always works perfectly. I need to go into that more carefully, I think. But roughly speaking, um, we have a strong core value uh, situation, and then we can talk about proportional implementation uh, of other things um, or limitations that could be still proportional uh, in this wider circle. The second element of this quantification of the normative content has to do with the implementation review. Unless we quantify the content, um, and therefore make it measurable, how are we going to make it reviewable? That is especially true uh, in the case of economic, social and cultural rights, but it is also true uh, for other rights as well, especially as we see civil and political rights develop more and more. Um, we need to we move away from this binary approach of black and white. You know, it's it's the right to uh, to leave or not to leave, uh, where you the right to vote or not to vote. Where that's pretty straightforward. Everything else really is on a sliding scale, and you need to make sure whether you are actually at point three or point five or point nine or whatever. And and if you are between three and nine, that is acceptable. But if you fall below three, that is non, not acceptable. That is a breach. Therefore, the, the whole idea of this human rights impact assessment has to, to be uh, founded, has to be uh, really erected on the basis of this measurable, uh, I, I, understanding of the right, this quantification process. Um, that makes it more transparent, you are quite right in this. Uh, that makes it um, reviewable by non-lawyers as well, because sometimes lawyers understand ourselves as a little bit, um, I don't know, the, the, the shamans of, of, of the system. We do understand things that other people don't necessarily uh, <laughs> get it. Uh, so um, if you break that down in small bits, sometimes you just make it more approachable, uh, more practicable in, that, in their implementation. And that, and that's my final point, if you, make, if you break it down uh, and therefore you make it measurable and therefore reviewable, then you can also make it uh, make a more make the necessary balancing act in terms of collision so much easier because then you would know up to which point you can back off and at which point you really cannot move um, that would get you again to the concentric circles um, the core and 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 the periphery uh, of the discussion. I would stop here and just uh, wait for your reaction. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Maria. I, I think we speak the I think we speak the same language.
uh, except perhaps for the for the second part of your first big question. But I'll, I'll, I'll take the first one uh, first. Yes, I think you are perfectly right that, that there's a need to include also the notion of form. And you didn't use the words soft law and hard law, but in, in substance, you describe what many people call soft law and hard law. And I am in agreement with what you said. And uh, indeed, we see in human rights law and in other parts of international law as well, the uh, extended increasing use of other forms than strictly binding sources. Sources in the form which strictly gives rise to binding norms, treaties. Uh, and people tend to call them soft law. And I'm, I'm trying to use the notion of soft sources to make the point that treaties are hard sources where it's self-evident that they give rise to binding legal norms. But treaties are not the only source of hard norms. There can be also soft, source, soft sources contributing to the understanding of a composite norm. We may always need a hard source which carries the normativity. But then substantive elements come into play also through soft sources like uh, interpretive materials, expert meetings, political declarations. They all inform us of the content of the binding legal norm. So we may use different terminology, but I'm with you there in the first part of the first question. And the second part, uh, I don't uh, I don't disagree, but I simply think that I wasn't trying to cover that issue of uh, dynamic interpretation, evolution, and and uh, and progressive development of human rights law. I'm in favor of that approach, but I think it it is a separate discussion in the sense that uh, a catalog of human rights is fixed. I don't see the emergence of genuinely new human rights. But what we have is ultimately formulated at, the such, at such a high level of abstraction, for instance, in the Universal Declaration, that there will always be room for progressive interpretive development. So the progressive development is in the interpretation. And seemingly, it's about, it's about inventing totally new human rights. But ultimately, they have their basis in the Universal Declaration and the Catalog of Human Rights. My favorite example is Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which has given rise to so many unpredicted chains of development through interpretation that it has been a progressive development. Why I think it's a di separate discussion than tonight is that this is a question of how human rights law lives under challenges from society. So it's so societal change and social movements that formulate new human rights claims. And what we have as established human rights through case law of the European Court of Human Rights is simply responses to claims made in the past. And it's an open book how many new claims can be formulated, for instance, under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And Faye and others who have worked on a treaty body, they, they, they know the feeling when you get a completely new issue raised in a case, how it kind of opens the interpretation of a treaty provision we thought we knew, but, but there, there's a new aspect, there's a new page turned. And then you go back to the toolbox you have, uh, trying to create a coherent, coherence-based, all things considered interpretation of the old text in light of uh, current situation and in, in response to the new human rights claim that is presented. Um, this is about facts and norms, but here we have the social change and the third actor, <laughs> the, the the uh, 
social movements or challenges coming from uh, new cases, which which is something I didn't touch upon today. But Martin, if I may, um, I mean, is it? Wouldn't this just be an evol evaluative interpretation? You know, wouldn't this be within the process of whoever is looking at a text, as you say, to to, to solve a case or yeah. to do anything? To me, yes. To me, yes. I, I, I mean, don't. I, I don't see. I don't see a hard uh, wall between evolutive interpretation and progressive development. But we do push the frontier further in, isn't it? Yes, the, the frontier is pushed, and yes. and and. Uh, of course, progressive development may be, may be used in a way which requires the intervention of a leg legislature, which would be the International Law Commission and the General Assembly in the form of a treaty. Which brings in the question of consent. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, which, yeah, which, which, I mean, which is the, a different the, story. if I may again, sorry, Maria. And no, Martin, that's exactly I mean, the thing. That, it, that... it brings in, yeah, I mean, well, I'm not sure you can equate evaluative okay. interpretation with progressive development okay. in a sense that at some point you need to, I mean, someone's going to, you know, come and contest. Yeah, so point taken, point taken. I, I can accept, I can accept that there is a difference if, if, we, if we refer to progressive development in the sense of the legislature's in, intervention needed, then there is a categorical difference, but the line is very hard to draw. And, and there are overlapping competencies that what perhaps looked as requiring the legislature can be relativized in the long run through evolutive uh, interpretation. Then Maria's second part was uh, about the human rights assessment and I agree is especially about the concentric circles. The, uh, the audience may not notice but you, you, you use the word necessity when you meant essence. The core is the essence of a right, the absolute red line, which Alexei doesn't see. But I think it's important that in human rights law, we insist that there is an inviolable essential core, not only in non-durable rights, but in all human rights. And the rest is then subject to proportionality. It's simplistic to say that there's one core and then a larger periphery, because in many cases, if we use the notion of attributes, we would find multiple core areas within one and the same right, surrounded by then the framework of what's then subject to, to, to uh, proportionality. And your second comment here was about the non-binary nature of human rights. And uh, of course, there is a difference in the treaties in the sense that economic, social, cultural rights accept progressive realization, whereas civil and political rights are assumed to be immediate. But I think the notion of positive obligation softens this in the sense that what's immediate is the prohibition to violate human rights. One can say that that's from day one as an absolute obligation under civil and political rights would also be under economic social rights, the violations. But, but beyond violations, we have positive human rights obligations, also under civil and political rights. And there it is a question of more or less. And one can accept the gradual approach. And uh, I think in theory, we would say there's obligations of conduct and obligations of result. And there's often obligation of conduct to work towards full enjoyment by gradually improving also the implementation of civil and political rights. I'll take a one minute break to check what my daughter is doing. Uh, I'll be back very soon. Okay. I'll, I'll see what video she's watching. Okay. <laughs> That's the balance between family and professional life that uh, I was talking about earlier today. <coughs> Martina, if you can uh, gather questions, I, I um, and then, um, when Professor Shining comes back and, and uh, concludes, we, we can also have questions, okay? I know there's um, the interpretation application um, dichotomy.
Um, maybe Gurgurinis wants to come in and say his uh, story. But there's also something else about necessity that I would want to come back on. Um, yeah, 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 it's very interesting. So, and well, perhaps we need to remind people that there is also the chat function, and therefore, you yeah, 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 the raise it. Yeah. But if you have the possibility, Martina, from the Facebook and YouTube, you you just let us know, or, or if you have questions, you'll just um, I will give you the floor. Yes, I will, I will let you know. I'm gathering questions. I haven't received anything. I think Nicolas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have questions from other people here. Good to see you, Yakovos. It's been such a, a long time. I mean, <laughs> questions live. <laughs> Go ahead. Good to see you as well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good to have you with us. We're so far away. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm glad to see such a big, uh, even names I don't know. I guess these are the new LLMs, perhaps, Maria. Um, some of them. Yes. Some of them. Okay. Right. I think that we have a hand. Yakovos is actually willing to take the plunge, I think. <laughs> Everything's safe with your daughter? Okay. Uh... <laughs> you have to we can't hear one. you. We can't hear you. Yeah, she has her Apple and she has her iPad. <laughs> okay. So if we're not interrupting, <laughs> uh, Yakovo, uh, Mr. Yakovid, Yakovos Yakovidis would like to ask a question. Um, First of all, diplomat uh, from uh, Geneva, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Faye, thank you, Maria, and thank you, PIL Athens, for uh, organizing this. Uh, good afternoon, Professor Martin Shining. You may not remember me, but I mean, I enjoy uh, this this afternoon as I when I was in Florence uh, as a Max Weber Fellow, and I had the opportunity to hear you many times uh, and uh, always uh, thorough to the point. Um, I just want to bring something, um, I think, which is underlying in the discussion, but um, it's there. Uh, the Human Rights Council uh, in, in September adopted um, a new resolution, uh, which we initiated as Greece, along with a core group of countries, uh, mainly Singapore, um, Chile and uh, Switzerland, on uh, the impact of neurotechnology on human rights. So for, uh, for those of us who are not tech savvy, me included, neurotechnology means when we connect the brain to a hard disk. We download thoughts, we download everything, and then we put them back. Uh, there, there, there have been some, some applications recently um, on Alzheimer, and, and then this seems to be really uh, promising and helpful for, for the future. However, um, the commercial exploitation of this process starts. Uh, my American colleague here in Geneva, I didn't mention I'm in Geneva, so good afternoon from Geneva, uh, told me that uh, even Elon Musk is, is into it and, and trying to, to work on neurotechnology. So um, we adopted this resolution, which uh, basically asks the advisory committee of the Human Rights Council to produce a study in two years. So it will be uh, presented to the Human Rights Council in September 2024 during its 57th session on the impact that neurotechnology may have on human rights. As you can all imagine, there, there are like um, many issues that are raised. Um, and first and, and foremost, uh, the issue of mental, mental privacy and also how we should um, keep the, the sense of identity that everyone has. And of course, what uh, Professor Shannon mentioned on uh, whether there is this discussion, whether we have new human rights or not. So a lot of people were saying that we're going to uh, to have a new generation of neuro rights. But I have a tendency to agree with what was said before that it's not new human rights. We are in, in the context of, um, of the existing human rights uh, framework, but we have to see how we will adapt them to the new reality. So uh, to make it shorter, my, my question is, how do you think, given the, the, the presentation and the discussion we have so far, that these new developments uh, in technology will uh, will affect and uh, will impact um, human rights. We are in front of the frontier issue. Um, the Secretary General Guterres, in, in his document, Our Common Agenda, he mentioned the technology ex exactly as a frontier issue. So um, how do you think that this whole discussion on the philosophical discussion between norms and facts comes and um, finds this, 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 this new development? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my question. Thanks. 
Shall I respond, reply directly? Okay. Sure. I think my short and main answer is that in these challenging situations, one should always resist the temptation to say there's a gap and we need a new treaty. I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's more important to go back to the basics. And uh, for instance, this question of neurotechnology raises issues of uh, human dignity, uh, inhuman treatment, and right to privacy. The, privacy, the, the, of course. Mm -hmm. The, the, the um, most clearly affected, right, as, as in so many other forms of surveillance. And then I would put it into the rather the bigger framework of biotechnology and human rights, where we have different forms of biosurveillance with partly overlapping consequences like uh, iris scans and facial recognition. Um, uh, this remote uh, sensors that uh, are able to detect emotions, etc. When we move to neurotechnology, we get closer to the brain, and indeed, uh, it is possible to look into the activation of specific regions of the regions of the brain, for instance, by showing showing images, which gives rise to, uh, for for instance, uh, not direct reading of thoughts, but for as as an example more advanced lie detectors that has ever been before, which is, of course, very useful in criminal trials. And we should resist those temptations, but go back to the toolbox. We have the tools. And it's a question of the evolutive interpretation of existing human rights rather than in inventing new ones. Uh, but first, we need the facts. Thank you. Nicola, before I give you the floor, can I ask another a question that I had in my mind and before I forget it or make a comment? Uh, my basic issue is with your fourth point or fourth and fifth, maybe. And I mean, as I was listening to you, um, uh, you know, you have, you say, well, Focus, we, we should focus on, you know, test for on permission, uh, going to permissible limitation on human rights. But then that this approach can also be extended um, to from negative to positive obligations. And I'm wondering, um, as I was hearing you, I, I mean, how how can we do this? And what would actually be the benefit, if you wish, of this? Other than if I understand a, a non-collision, or I just I, I I don't I I'd like some more feedback from you on, on this issue because uh, it looks it seems very interesting, but um, I just want to see where you stand. Thank you. Well, I think point five was meant to show the benefit, which is that in times of crisis when human rights of different people collide and different human rights of different people collide. There are so many who would throw their arms, arms up in the air and say, human rights give us no answers. And I think then we need to semi-quantify human rights, which are on opposite sides in a given situation. And that we can only do if we also apply a similar scheme than the permissible limitations approach in respect of positive obligations. And I think the indicator projects project um, provides many tools for that, like uh, a semi quantification also on the positive obligations side. But that's the short answer that um, it is a collision avoiding approach, which uh, expands on the permissible limitations test perhaps an unoptimistic approach but anyway um uh, i think nicolas has a question can i ask a, a question too can i ask a question too sorry anastasia may i 
Anastasios, go ahead. Yes, oh, yes. I can see you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, no, I have issues with my camera. Thank you very much, Professor Saini. Now, my questions are, I'm not going to talk about the distinction between interpretation and application. I carefully heard your view. It's very elaborate. I have, okay, I have my own view, which is, and we are in, in disagreement, perhaps. But what I'd like to focus is on two points. The first point is, I would like you to elaborate a bit more on whether, on, on the role that state consent plays when it comes to the evolutive or evolutionary uh, interpretation of human rights instruments. And if state consent is, is indeed part of the process, so it's not something that has a life of, of, of its own, that is escaping the control of the states that actually drafted the treaties, what, uh, do you see any, any scope, any potential for authentic, uh, authentic interpretation by the treaty parties, for example, at a later date? So, for instance, what, what if is it possible for, for parties to a treaty jointly, all together, if they disagree, strongly disagree with, uh, with the findings of a human rights adjudicative organ, to simply come out and make a, a, make a joint declaration, straightening things out, correcting an interpretation that could be seen as activist? Thank you very much. That's a good question, and I... I do think that human rights law has evolved uh, to a point where in some respects it's above the individual consent of states. We have the Human Rights Committee General Comment 27 position that unilateral withdrawal from the two covenants is not allowed. We have Human Rights Committee position in General Government 24 that reservations are subject to the object and purpose test and states can be bound by the main, their main intention to be a party. They can't withdraw, so they are in without uh, the benefit of the reservation. So we have these developments. And what you ask, can this be overruled through on the authentic interpretation by all parties? And my answer is yes. Of course, it's, it's, it's politically uh, unfortunate that one could see states jointly overrule, for instance, a finding by the Human Rights Committee. But I, I, I think, legally speaking, um, yes, they could amend the treaty, or they could even, as you suggest, create uniform state practice by agreeing on an interpretation which is different, for instance, in the form of a declaration. Um, I have myself suggested a different route, which would be that if uh, a particular state is unhappy, for instance, after losing a case in the Human Rights Committee with the outcome, they would challenge the interpretation in the General Assembly and ask for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. So the ICJ would become an appeal body. Also under those human rights treaties which do not provide a role for the ICJ. They, they, they could review and through an advisory opinion the interpretation of a treaty body and I think that would be a route I would favor to, to keep the matter within the realm of judicial application of existing law rather than having state straightforward overrule interpretations. If I can add here though that, um, I mean, before reaching the General Assembly or before that, uh, we, uh, treaty bodies see it very often because treaty bodies engage with states. So it happens, for example, when they meet with the state parties of a certain treaty. And there I can assure you that um, while states might not be um, joining in a huge group, you know, to uh, dispute an interpretation by a treaty body, um, you often see uh, certain states who have a consistent position and saying, well, okay, uh, we don't, you know, you do this, but you know, the cov this is the covenant or this is the treaty. And, and this is a consistent position that they come back with in any form of say engagement with, uh, with treaty bodies. So we see that as well, you know, this sort of pushback uh, from states who, on whose consent, of course, uh, many mechanisms uh, depend upon, yeah. So that was just, uh, so Nicolas, you? 
And Martina, then I'll, I'll give you the floor if you have questions. Uh, Nicola? Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, thank you, Professor Schein, for your presentation. Um, I will resist the temptation to talk about progressive development. I have many things to say on that, but I will not. However, um, I would like to pick up on your last point, basically your last sentence. So you went very quickly around the issue of human rights inflation or human rights proliferation. Um, to my mind, it's a very strong argument that when um, we overly use the, uh, the term and human rights and we invent new rights and we give um, human rights to new groups of people, the human rights of the elderly or human rights for, I don't know, uh, you name it. Um, this does create uh, too much by coinage and this inevitably uh, will um, you know um, demote the value of the term human right um, and I would like to invite you to give us your view on how do you get around this issue and this problem um, because you, you skimmed through it very quickly at the end and and uh, at least to my mind I would like a, a bit of a more elaborate, you know, explanation on that. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. However, it was stimulating. Well, in part, your question relates to the legitimacy of human rights adjudication in the eyes of the public at large. And uh, perhaps there have been moments some decades ago where there was a fear that human rights bodies are running too fast <laughs> and creating new interpretations quicker than societies are willing to accept. But I think the tide has turned in the sense that there's too much concern now about the legitimacy of human rights bodies simply in the eyes of governments. So the governments are seen as the legitimacy control of uh, rather careful application of binding legal norms. And my answer in the current situation is that I don't see a risk of undue illegitimate proliferation of human rights through interpretation in today's world. What I see as a risk is frustration in the human rights community resulting in what, what I would call substitute action to create new and new human rights instruments. And here I'm strongly against proliferation. And I'm, I'm in the camp of Philip Alston concerning the need for quality control. And I think it has been very wise that in recent decades, much of the treaty development has been about improving the procedures. New complaint mechanisms introduced under treaties that already existed, but by and large, avoiding to create new substantive norms. And where we have new substantive norms, they nowadays tend to be watered down versions of <laughs> treaties that existed already before. And I, I, I think that's a, that's a negative side of the proliferation. And that's one reason I responded earlier that uh, one should not react to the neurotechnology challenge by saying we need a new treaty. No, we don't. Thank you. I uh, yeah, agree with you on that one. Uh, uh, Eleni, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Professor Shining. It was very stimulating. Um, I have a comment and question if uh, you would like to answer. Uh, the comment is uh, contrary to Nicolas, who didn't dare to proceed on progressive development, I would like just to uh, comment on that. Well, my idea is that progressive development is the outcome of interpretation. When, as you said, societal changes arise and the law needs to adapt. At least that's the European court uh, says all the time when, when it goes on with interpreting its own provisions and makes uh, under brackets a uh, new law. Uh, that, that's the, the main idea, uh, if you like to, to comment on that. And the question is, uh, speaking, as I was listening on your speech and ideas about uh, normativity, uh, 
do you think, well, I was uh, recalling what Professor Vail back in the 80s spoke about relative normativity. So uh, do you agree on that? And how do you see that um, human rights are going that way? Uh, and in what context, if I may ask? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Professor Vail's uh, article on so-called soft law is still one of the very best academic <laughs> uh, treatments of the subject. So I, I, I think there's a, it's worth reading. Of course, it doesn't totally reflect on the various forms of creation of soft sources. And I don't think my approach is exactly the same. I, I'm more of the idea of a support of the idea of a composite norm that there's always a hard source forming the normativity, carrying the legal norm, but then you add elements from the so-called soft sources. Progressive development, I'm quite pessimistic about the European Court of Human Rights, which I see as, a, as being in the process of degeneration uh, of uh, the level of human rights and, and what they say about the evolving standard is largely lip service today. They are on the defense and I'm referring back to the legitimacy challenge they are facing from the side of quite restrictive governments in difficult times. I'm a, an eternal optimist generally, but I have worked more in the UN uh, human rights framework. And what makes me the eternal optimist there is that uh, they have less powers, which makes them more free to be creative. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, okay, yes. the, the, this uh, goes Perhaps off. as well, <laughs> yes, the non-binding, yeah. Uh, Martina, do we have any, do you have any comments, my dear, on um, um, sources as well, because you're also working on that, and Professor Shining, and let me know if we have any more comments, and yes. then I'll turn to Maria. Yeah. Don't have any more questions or comments um, from my side, from the sources side. Just a very brief question. Um, you didn't really elaborate on general principles of law. Um, but I would like to ask you your opinion on whether you, what's your interpretation of this source and more specifically, whether you embrace the Sima and Alston's perspective on the customer international law and general principles of uh, them stemming more from the international arena as well as the domestic one. And um, yes, and how does that um, fall into your theory or your approach towards the sources? Well, general principles of law is the third, so third main source of norms of international law. And uh, wh where I think I would add to what Sima and Alston say is that it's not a given how general principles of law derived from national legal orders permeate into the realm of international law. Usually, uh, a customary norm would be an intermediate step. So when, for instance, the International Court of Justice would build itself on uh, national legal orders in deriving a general principle of law, which amounts to a norm of international law, I think it should also say this is a norm of customary international law. So it, General principles of law derived from national legal orders give usually rise to customary norms of international law. That's the form in international law. But one could also say that some of the treaty making process is about codification of principles derived from national legal orders. So there's a different route also from the source of general principles of law to treaties as a form that carries those norms into the legal sphere of public international law. Thank you. 
Could I ask another question that I forgot before, Martin? Um, you were talking about, you know, a combined model of rules and principles uh, at a point, and you mentioned that the general comment, uh, Christoph Heinz's general uh, work on the general comment number 37. But I was wondering whether, you know, it, this type of combined form of empirical interpretive materials is 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 suited to when an organ you know issues like a general comment and is more free to sort of look into <clears throat> other factors than when, for example, an organ um, uh, looks at something through a judicial viewpoint. You know I, what I mean is I mean. Take the European court, okay? I won't take the treaty bodies. I'll take the European court and ask if this model could be, could be used or is used by the court when it's considering the cases brought before it. Well, I think it is important also in the adjudicative process to keep the, retain the difference between rules and principles in the sense that it's sometimes an easy way out in the determination of a case to say this is a breach of the essential core hence we don't need to go into the proportionality assessment this is what done is done by the european court of justice in the max schrems case where it says this is mass surveillance and mass surveillance is unacceptable it breaches the essence of privacy rights end of the case <laughs> No need to discuss proportionality. It's, a, it's, it's analogous to the requirement of a legal basis. When there's no legal basis, the case ends there. And similarly, when there's a breach of the essential core, you would not need to go any further. So it's, it's, a, it's a good way out. And where we have this as living law is, of course, issues of non refuma where I think it's important to hold the line that when the case falls under prohibited situations of reform, then you don't go into proportionality assessment to discuss, for instance, the gravity of the crime as compared to the likelihood of the torture. You simply say <laughs> the, the risk of torture is enough. No proportionality needed. Yeah, but you still have to find the risk, and the risk has to be personal. I mean, there's certain I mean, there's certain yes. elements that you can't overcome just to you know protect an individual. I agree, but uh, but those are interpretations. Because these of are the most. I have to say that these are the most difficult cases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are the deportation cases. But, but those are, in, that is interpretation, but the interpretation of the scope of the, uh, of the core. Yeah. Yeah. How big is the core? Yeah. It's not about proportionality, balancing. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Maria, over to you. Sorry, I sort of, I probably I interrupted you. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm <laughs> having my life away, so feel free. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to make a final comment, actually. And that final comment is that um, in uh, the 72 years or how many other um, since the European Convention uh, on Human Rights, which is essentially the first binding instrument uh, on, on human rights, the only one preceding it is the Universal Declaration of, this, of the time as non-binding. Um, we have seen a whole universe of human rights erupting really. Um, we do discuss um, a superstructure of, of human rights that are built on the foundation of the treaties. Uh, and uh, in truth, if somebody were to just read the text uh, and uh, would miss enormously the, 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 the whole uh, expansion, the, the whole extent, uh, the, the whole remit of, of uh, human rights protection. On the other hand, and that was a statement that sort of struck me, you said earlier that uh, the list uh, is, uh, is uh, fixed. That's it. No more, no less. 
I wonder. I mean, law is reactive, isn't it? Um, law follows the needs of society. Um, what kind of needs uh, would come around that would perhaps necessitate the creation of a new human right? I wonder. Uh, one that would not evolve from private life or the right to life or something like that. And I would stop there with a big question mark. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, Maria, I'm happy to leave that question open. <laughs> I'm, I, I am a believer that there is one tree of human rights, which has its roots deep in the history of humankind and different ideologies, religions, cultural traditions. Uh, all aggregate in, in, in within a humanist tradition, which is individual centered. And that's the revolution of human rights, the individual as a subject in relation to the state. And they did a pretty good job in 1948. And my generation would not do a better job today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, true to our humanistic uh legacy as true Europeans. <laughs> um, I think our time is, is running uh, short, uh, but uh, I, I know that you have um, your, child, your child also, your daughter. Uh, let me say that this has been very enlightening, Martin. Um, we thank you very much for being with us. Um, I think it was an opportunity really to look at um, human rights and maybe international law also in a different way in a, from a different perspective at least theoretical uh, i want to thank you very much uh, on behalf of my colleagues uh, maria thank you very much for your thoughtful interventions and uh, the discussion ensuing and uh, we look forward to seeing you again uh, martin uh, somewhere in the world because you're so uh, Optimistic, I think uh, <laughs> you leave us some room for hope because as yeah. I leave Geneva, I'm starting to feel quite pessimistic. Thank you, Faye. Uh, very good to meet you all and hope to see you soon. Maybe Thank you. In a Thank you. One day. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you so Thank very you. much, Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.